All right, if you guys heard me talking slow introducing NBA news, that is because Hoppy TV was down for a second, and since I don't have a co-host or a video team around me because I'm just a little podcast out of Tampa, I have to do a lot of things at once. So if you heard me talking slow introducing these segments, that's because I was trying to reload Facebook. But we are back. All right, I saw this here. This is the NBA update on Hoppy Hour, brought to you by Main Event Boxing. This is from ProBasketballTalk.com. All right. Here's my thing, and it says Dwight Howard wants to play seven more years, which is fair. He's like 31 years old, and he says he is a Hall of Famer. And before I even get into the article, I'm not, dis, uh, I'm not disagreeing with what Dwight Howard said when he said that he's a Hall of Famer. I'm not saying he's not a Hall of Famer, but... To come out right now, at the age of 31, it's not like you're about to retire. You have seven more years left in the tank. To come out, and you have all this time left to win a ring, to already imply you're a Hall of Famer is proving the point of why you're never going to win a ring and why you're never going to be regarded as one of the best centers of all time. Because a true Hall of Famer, a true winner would say, I'm not thinking about that right now. A true winner would say, I'm focused on winning a ring and improving my legacy. But this quote where he said that he's a Hall of Famer and he's saying it already, proves that Dwight Howard is never going to win a ring if it's his team unless he rides the bench because he doesn't have the heart of a winner. I mean, in 2009, he did all he could to take the Magic to the Finals. But then he ended up pouting and they lost in five games to the Lakers. And then all the years in the playoffs with the Magic. And then the one-year debacle with the Lakers. And then the few years he was on the Rockets. And this year on the Hawks. Dwight Howard is just a guy who never is able to take a team to the next level. And what's so disappointing about Dwight Howard is we live in an era where we lack centers like Shaquille O'Neal, Hakeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell. There's so many great big men that didn't play in this era. So he had a phenomenal opportunity these last 12 years he's been in the league to take over and be one of the best centers ever. But it just shows his heart and his will at the fact that he gets mad at uh, people that are in the crowd heckling at him, that he's just not the most likable teammate. It just shows that he's never going to be regarded as one of the all-time greats, even if he makes it into the playoffs. It says here, Dwight Howard has had a remarkable time in the NBA. We're talking about a three-time Defensive Player of the Year. He's gone to 11 games. He's been an eight-time All-NBA, and he has averaged 17 points and 12 rebounds. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with the article when they say that he's had a remark that he's had a remarkable rather time in the NBA because he's had a great time. I just think Dwight Howard, with the lack of centers in the league and the fact that there's a time that he joined when there weren't that many great players. He's had this phenomenal opportunity to take over the league. But that's what leaves Dwight Howard out of the categories with the other great centers, is that he just hasn't been able to get it done to this point. It says here, but bring up Howard and you hear about the ugly exits from Orlando, Los Angeles, and last year with the Rockets, about a guy seen as not taking himself seriously and the game itself seriously. Howard talked to Mark Spears, one of the NBA reporters, and here was what, here's what Mark asked Dwight. How much longer do you want to play? I want to get in 20 years. Now I'm at 13. And here's what Mark Spears asked Dwight Howard next. Do you feel like you've built a resume worthy enough to be in the NBA Hall of Fame? And here's his quote. No doubt. It's kind of swept under the rug because of the perception of all the things that happened in Orlando. There's not a perception, Dwight, of what happened in Orlando. You basically gave up on the team and just cried your way to Los Angeles where you were there for one year. There's no real perception. You couldn't get the job done. You had the team in the finals in 2009, and I don't care if the Lakers were a better team. You're in the finals. Achieve that moment. There's no perception, Dwight. You weren't screwed over. You made a lifetime of amount of money playing on that team. And you are going to go into the Hall of Fame because of your time on that team. There's no perception. Nothing went wrong. You just couldn't get the job done. 
back to the quote from Dwight Howard, all the media things. If you look at basketball itself, and I don't ever talk about myself, but winning three Defensive Player of the Year trophies has never been done. Great, Dwight. I'm glad you're happy that you won three Defensive Player of the Year awards. It's great, man. I'm really happy for you. But here's the thing. A great player wouldn't care about those little accolades. You never heard Kobe saying, oh my God, I made it to the All-NBA team ten times. Oh my God, I made it to double digits. You would hear Kobe talk about how he wanted six rings, like Jordan. And you hear LeBron, you hear LeBron talking about how he wants to win championships. And you hear Durant saying he joined the Warriors because he wants to win championships. You hear all the great players saying they want to win championships, but then you hear the narcissism and the lack of confidence from Dwight when he's saying, I'm already going to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah! Get the hell out of here. You're going to make the Hall of Fame, but this is such a cheesy, self-centered answer. Like, no wonder you're never going to win a ring. It says here, this is from Pro Basketball Talk, the article continues, Howard's critics will hate this, but he's right. He is a future Hall of Famer. It's not a debate. He's got the resume even without a ring. And if you go by the simple criteria of one of the best of his era, then he is one of the best. And again, Dwight Howard has accomplished more than 99.9% .9 of people will in their lifetime and basically every NBA player ever. He's going to go into the Hall of Fame. He's an all-time great player. But that doesn't mean that he's a great player because he had such an amazing chance throughout those years with the lack of players where he could have been the best center and he could have just taken over. The lack of players in his era... He should have dominated. He should have been going for 27 points and 18 rebounds every game. There were times in the playoffs, or there were times in the regular season where you would see this little, like, potential in Dwight. It was like the light at the end of the tunnel where you go, wow, he's finally going to figure it out. But then he just goes back to being average and never being better at free throws. So, to me, this article just kind of defines Dwight Howard's legacy is that he's going to go into the Hall of Fame, but he's never going to be an all-time great player because an all-time great player would have been focused on winning his first ring at the age of 31, especially when you choked in the finals eight years ago. Also coming up in the NBA update on Happy Hour, this is from Pro Basketball Talk again, Russell Westbrook, when told that Curry said that James Harden, his former teammate, should be MVP, here is what Russell Westbrook said, and I quote, Who's he? On Monday, Curry was making the media rounds, and that included his appearance on the nationally syndicated Dan Patrick radio show. There, when asked, Curry said he probably would choose James Harden right now as MVP because of how far he has taken the Rockets up in the rankings. Russell Westbrook was told what Curry said, and he responded with the most Westbrook of answers, it says here. And his answer is, who is he? Now, I'm not saying that Russell Westbrook isn't going to win the MVP, and I'm not saying that he's a shoe-in to win the MVP because James Harden has had a great year, but when you're saying to the media, to the response, that Curry thinks that Harden, your former teammate, should be the MVP, when your response is, I don't care, who is he again? That is going to prevent you, Russell, from getting votes because the media is going to look back on this moment when you threw shade at one of your former teammates that you went to the NBA Finals with and you said, who is he? They're going to look at your arrogance that you think you're a shoe in for the MVP. So if I was Russell Westbrook's PR team, if I was smart enough, I would be mad that he had this answer because he could have come off likable and been like, well, it's a tie race. You never know what can happen, but I hope to win. But the fact that he shows this arrogance could potentially prevent him from winning the MVP. It says that this is the most unique MVP race in at least a decade. Because you make a very hard case for four players. Harden, Westbrook, Leonard on the Spurs, and LeBron James. Leonard doesn't get enough credit, but the issue is he's not playing on a major market team. And he's not playing on the Lakers, or the Celtics, or the Knicks, or the Bulls, or the Heat, where Leonard would shine. 
The issue with Leonard is that he's in San Antonio. It's a great, great basketball town. They love their Spurs. It's a great franchise. They have five championships. They had so many good years with Tim Duncan and right now with Greg Popovich. But the issue is you're not playing in the biggest market in Texas and you're in a market that's not known for many things. I'm not saying that it's not a great town there. I'm just saying it's not a major market that people think of. So Leonard may never win an MVP unless he has a remarkable season because everybody's going to overlook it. I'm just saying that's how things are. Tweet at me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you want to let me know why I should be right. Add Ryan Hoppy Radio. Get the Hoppy Radio app in the Google Play and iPhone shop by searching up Hoppy Radio. H-O-P-P-E Radio. There you can talk to me and message me in real time. Dwayne Wade also, it says here from the NBA report, is out for the season. And I'm not going to even break down the Bulls record. I'm not going to even say if Fred Hoiberg is a good coach or not. This is just from the outsider's view, a person that doesn't live in Chicago, so I don't have the access to sports radio in Chicago where I could hear their take. I don't have access to the newspaper or the local news where I can hear the opinions within the Windy City. This is just from a spectator, somebody who grew up in Chicago, who loves the Bulls, and who has been a fan of Dwayne Wade. It's something I've observed about this team, about the Bulls this year. There's absolutely no leadership. When you look at Fred Hoiberg coaching on the sidelines, he just looks like a lost puppy in traffic. He knows that none of the players really get along. They don't know how to play together. And the team is not going to make the playoffs. So, like, what are you coaching for? To hopefully not lose your job. And something else I've noticed as an outsider watching the Bulls when I can from Tampa Bay, where there's a lack of NBA at the bars, which is fine because it's not a basketball town. Another thing I've noticed about the Bulls is that you had so much potential in the beginning of the season with Doug McDermott, with the uh, Serbian player whose name uh, Nikola Mirotic, who hasn't really played out to what people thought he would be. He'd be the next Dirk Nowitzki. You had Taj Gibson. You had Jimmy Butler. You had Dwayne Wade. You had Rondo. You had all this potential. Everybody thinking you'd make the playoffs. In some way and somehow, the lack of a good coach is the reason why all those players actually were bitching about each other to the media and not to each other's faces like men in the locker room and why this team's not going to the playoffs. And if you ask me, if you would have had Tom Thibodeau as the coach and Gar Foreman and John Paxson, those buffoons in the Chicago Bulls general office, if you didn't have them getting rid of Tom Thibodeau a few years ago, this franchise would have been in such a better position but they have literally ran it into the ground. All right, here's the deal. We are going to come back on Happy Hour and talk about everything going on in the news, but I want to hear from you guys. 856-49-HOPPY. 856-49-HOPPY. Tweet at me, at Ryan Hoppy Radio, and get the Hoppy Radio app. We will be right back. What's up? This is Ryan Hobby from the award-winning Hobby Hour podcast and winner of the fight against Jake Heron of the Crowded Table. It's the Mike Calpa Punch-Out. And the main reason that I won that fight was because of the training that I got from main event boxing in St. Petersburg. And now maybe you're not even going into a boxing match, but you want to get into shape. And you're sick and tired of looking at your gut. And you're sick and tired of going to the gym and getting average results. You're saying to yourself, man, how can I get into the best shape of my life, especially here in Tampa Bay, where you should have a summer body all the time? Cheers to St. Patrick's Day! Turn up! When you need to go to main event boxing in St. Pete, there are so much... I am so white. It's ridiculous. Including the fact that they have a high-intensity 30-minute body workout which focuses on every part of your body and conditioning. They will make sure they will now wear you out, and each day is a different workout, and they really do care about seeing the progress you have as a person and with the muscles you will gain after coming to Man Event Boxing. To get into contact with them, it's not hard. It's not rocket science. All you got to do is call Josh, the owner and trainer, at 727 564 
3948. That's 727-564-3948. And you can visit them in person at 2575 28th Avenue North in Edson, St. Petersburg. Trust me when I say, main event boxing is the best in the Bay. Syndicated on IRN and heard around the world on the Hobby Radio app. You are tuned in to Hobby Hour. Welcome back to Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. Tweet at me, at Ryan Hoppy Radio, and get the Hoppy Radio app in the Google Play and iPhone shop by searching up Hoppy Radio, H-O-P-P-E Radio. There you can chat me live. Shout out to Bo Fraley, who is a listener from Cleveland, who is chiming in, and so is Andrew Havad. I hope I know how to say your last name cor- correctly. I appreciate you listening, and I appreciate your brother up in Seattle who listens to Hoppy Hour and is spreading the word up there. All right, this next topic I don't want to come off like a curmudgeon for. This next topic I don't want to seem like I'm being mean. Because it's going to kind of hit the heart of a lot of people that are either Facebook friends with me, that are potentially uh, people that are in my family, or people that I'm friends with, or coworkers. I'm not trying to come off like a jerk when I say this. But I don't get what the big deal of being a vegan is I don't get why you need to let everybody know that you're a vegan and it is just getting out of hand it's becoming something where they judge you because you're the majority which is a carnivore which you like to eat meat but all of a sudden the vegans feel like they have this voice where they can judge you all the time and if you post any picture of your meat on Facebook and not your junk what I'm saying is like the meat on the grill or if you're going out to eat and you get wings and you take a picture of it you have that one vegan friend that's like do you know what they did to that animal of course I do but I don't think about it I just like how chicken wings t- taste honey shut up I'm so sick of these vegans that always have to brag about it and this isn't about anybody specifically but when you're in the office or you're at the gym you have that one vegan friend who needs to name drop that his girlfriend got him into being a vegan. Or if it's a girl, that she's just beginning it and she loves her vegan diet. Like, you don't hear me going, okay, well, tonight, guys, I'm going to have peas and corn, then I'm going to have Tyson's chicken and then rice, and then I'm going to go jog to the boxing gym. I just go about my life and I work out and I eat because I'm like every other person that likes to have meat. But all these vegans, because they're so different, and it's so rare, and there's not that many vegans, even though people are jumping on the bandwagon, they feel like they need to get the word out there, and they need to brag. And it's like, oh my God, do you realize that whenever somebody who's vegan brings up that they're vegan, if you're in a group of, if you're at, let's say, a cubicle, and you're around eight different people, and you're the one person out of the eight that brings up that you're a vegan, the rest of the people, all seven people are going, under their breath. They're all gasping with annoyance. Nobody has ever said, oh my God, I was having a bad day. But Jane breaking down her vegan diet and how it's changed her life just made my day. If it wasn't for Jane talking about how she's a vegan and how awful I am for eating meat, then I never would have had a great day. Trust me. Trust me when I say if you're a vegan and you think you're impressing anybody or you're thinking that anybody cares Trust me, no one is even impressed. Because I see this here, and it's from Quora.com, where you can ask the things that you need to know. Like, you can say, why was The Simpsons renewed for a 28th season? You can go, why was Abraham Lincoln our president? Quora.com, literally, you can ask anything on here, and it will have an answer. And here's what I typed in. Why are vegans so annoying? And here's their answer. Vegans are annoying for the way that they want to be included in the conversation they are the same type of people as the fitness freaks on facebook many of which also are into crossfit for some reason and they are all annoying 
and they are both annoying for the same reason for the same reason that a young adult keeps going on and talks about having sex or drinking alcohol on Facebook. It becomes very repetitive and nobody is impressed. They've just found this new thing in their life that they have incorporated into their lives and they love it. And now it's all they can talk about because they have nothing else to talk about, it says. And in most cases, they can't seem to quit talking about it because they want you to join in on the conversation or they want you to have some compliments for them. They think that this new thing, veganism or working out, is going to last forever and that it's going to help you live forever. Trust me, it's not. I don't know who wrote this answer on Quora.com or you can ask them anything, but that is the perfect definition of a vegan. And I'm not saying all vegans are annoying. I'm just saying that the majority of them have to let you know that they're a vegan. And it's like, shut up. And I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it because then you're literally beating a dead horse. And then they would yell at you for making that joke because it's about an animal. Kiss my ass, PETA. All right, I also saw this in the news here, but tweet at me, at Ryan Hoppy Radio, and get the Hoppy Radio app in the Google Play and iPhone shop. This next article, <laughs> it's hard to believe that this is real news, because you think things like this just happened in, like, pornos. Like, you would never assume that a Michigan mom had sex up to 15 times with a 14-year-old after sending him nude Snapchats. You would just think that that would be in a porno that you would potentially rent. You would think that that would just be in your dreams or in your potential lifetime that that would happen. But you would never think that that would actually happen in real time and that a 38-year-old woman would have sex with a 14-year-old up to 15 times. Brooke Lachinus, she's from Lima Township, Michigan, has been accused of having a sexual relationship with a boy who was 14 years old. The married mother, oh my God, is currently free after putting up bond. How do you explain that crime to your family when they post your bond and then you come home? And it's not like you got a DUI. Even if you to, it was in the moment. I didn't mean to beat up that person. Or if you get a DUI, you go, I was drunk, guys. Don't ever drink and drive. But how do you explain to your kids, yeah, you know how your friend is 14 years old? Yeah, I had sex with him like 15 times and he sent me a bunch of Snapchats. Yeah, trust me. Their relationship with their mom is forever ruined. A married Michigan mother appeared in court on Thursday to face charges for allegedly having sex with a 14-year-old boy. And you know what's weird is, and any guy who claims that they didn't have this growing up is lying, but there was that one hot mom, or that one hot teacher, or that one hot neighbor who's like in her mid-30s, and every teenage boy just gets the biggest heart on when she's around. Every teenage boy gets so excited, and you talk about how you want to bang that teacher, or that neighbor's so hot, or your friend's mom is really hot. But you never have sex with them because that would be weird for them to do. So when you're a kid, you want that to happen because you're horny and you want to get your rocks off. But once you become an adult, you look on it and it's really no different with a hot girl. If she's 38, like Brooke Laginus, who had sex with the kid 15 times who was 14, it's really no different between her having sex with a kid and a 38-year-old guy having sex with a 14-year-old girl. It's different where the girl is easier, is going to be taken advantage of easier, potentially. But at the same time, both the guy and the girl know what they're doing, and they're messing with a teenager's emotions. So at the end of the day, you're both pedophiles, and you're both weird. I just feel like the reason why we can't... The reason why we keep having the issues with these hot moms and these hot teachers who keep having sex with the underage kids is we don't prosecute it as hard as a male pedophile because we kind of see it as the fantasy we wanted growing up. So we go, uh, yeah, she screwed up. Let's just give her a five years and forget about it, you know? Oh, man, it says that her husband was the one who bailed her out and was with her at court. And they are saying that there is a great chance that there are more. Have you ever had sex with one of your teachers and you want to talk about it? All phone lines are open. 
49 Hoppy. 856 49 Hoppy. You can tweet at me at Ryan Hoppy Radio. Get the Hoppy Radio app and you can go play an iPhone shop by searching up Hoppy Radio. H O P P E Radio. There you can chat me live. All right. This segment has been brought to you by my guys over at Made of Unboxing. They are the reason why I beat Jay Karen of the Crowded Takeover on 1025 The Bound and need Mike Kelt to punch out back in November of 2016. Go there. Check them out at 2575 28th Avenue North in St. Pete. And call them at 727-564-3948. That's 727-564-3948. Tell them I sent you for a great deal. All right. We will be right back on Happy Hour. After this, do not touch that computer mouse, that tablet, however the hell you are listening to my show. Welcome back to Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. Tweet at me, at Ryan Hoppy Radio. Get the Hoppy Radio app in the Google Play and iPhone shop by searching up Hoppy Radio. H-O-P-P-E Radio. My guy! And I keep saying that. It's my crutch word. I need to quit saying my guy. It's very overused. One of my good friends, Kevin Holly, is watching the show. you got to check out his podcast, The Kevin Holly Show. And I see that Glick Chris, who is the host of the Vape and Chill podcast... He is watching as well. And the reason I give them shout-outs is I don't really have a fan base. I just have people that listen. But if you were to describe my listeners as the fan base, and I hate using that word because the show is not big yet, but I would say that Glick Chris and Kevin Holly are two of the original, and I will say OGs in a very Caucasian way, who have always had my back. All right. I see this in the news here. And uh, this doesn't surprise me, but it does at the same time. It says here, Uber's automated cars can only drive for a mile without humans' help. And the thing that's funny about this is they talked about how that the automated cars were being tried out in San Francisco and Pittsburgh and how this is going to be the next big thing. And there was a part of me, I just never, ever was really down with the automated car. And yeah, it's had a rocky progress so far. And it can just drive 0.7 miles, so not even a mile, without needing a human's help. Even if they get this fixed, and even if the automated car becomes the next big thing, you would have to wonder if it's even safe. Because machines don't work 100% of the time. 
What if you're in the car and it's going down the highway and it just doesn't see a car coming by and it gets into a crash? I don't know the mechanics and I don't know the inside details of the automated car, but nothing is perfect in life. Trust me when I say I would rather always until the day I die, whenever that is, always have an actual human driving me than a machine. I don't care how lifelike it is. I don't care if it's the year if it's the year 2045 and we have a robot like Bender from Futurama and he's able to drive a car. I will never ever have a machine or a computer drive me. I will always have a human. Leaked documents have shown the rocky progress of Uber's fleet. In February, the cars could only drive for 0.7 miles without help. In one week, they could only go 50 miles without making a critical error. Yeah. Uber could have waited five more years on this, but I think this was them trying to get ahead of Lyft. This was them freaking out because the taxi cabs, which have their hand up their ass at Uber, they were trying to kind of get ahead of everything and say, hey, look, we're innovative, but they tried everything out way too fast. They needed to wait a few more years because who's going to ever trust the automated car when you have reports like this when they say the automated car for Uber doesn't work? And before I get to the article, I'm going to defend Uber and Lyft. Because you have all the people who say that the ride-sharing apps is taking away local business and it's hurting taxis and you can hire any creep and you have incidents that happen in Uber. Well, first of all, it wasn't like taking a taxi, especially if you're in a big city like New York City was ever safe. You were always taking a risk when you go into any random person's car, even if it's a taxi, and you let them drive you around. So it's really no different if you go inside of a, let's say... Uber or you go inside of a taxi, you're basically putting your life in their hands on the highway because they can do anything. Second reason why it's so annoying when the taxi cabs and all the people bitch about Uber. The other annoying thing is this. You had literally 10 years, every taxi cab company, to come up with a mobile app, to come up with a marketing way to quote unquote reach the millennials and you guys saw that smartphone and that social media was becoming a big thing. And you had such a great chance. You, you could have grabbed it where you could have taken control of the last 10 years. But you let Lyft and Uber come on the scene and you never thought that there would be a rideshare app and you never thought that there would be a reason why you'd lose business so you just sat on your lazy ass and you were douchebags whenever you took a taxi and you were always awful drivers and in comes people that need money on the side like me and you're very focused when you're driving uber so don't bitch and moan at rideshare apps because we're better drivers than you and we work harder and we're less creepy I'm just saying Uber's automated cars can only drive for less than a mile without a human having to take over the wheel, according to shocking leaked data. I don't know how shocking that is, because if you ask me, I don't think the automated cars would have worked this fast. The cars which were being tried out in Pennsylvania, Arizona, and California could only drive for a mile without needing help. And during one week, they could, only, they could just drive for 50, it said before they would potentially hit a person or cause huge property damage. Internal documents have revealed the rocky progress of Uber's fleet. The taxi cab company first announced its intentions in August 2016. In the last six years, we have seen the profound impact that the smartphone has had, as well as what, with what we have done with Uber Eats. Exactly! You had everything. You had everything going for you. I'm not saying Uber's done as a company, but with everything that happened where they were siding with Trump and everything with these automated cars, your company isn't doing as great as it was two years ago. The image of Uber isn't as great. It says here, we have seen a profound impact of what we have done with the smartphone and Uber Eats. If you really believed in your profound outlook, an impact on what you've done with the smartphone phenomenon and having rideshare apps, you wouldn't have tried to do 
Uber, automated cars. You would have just let the ride go. You would have kept going into 2018, 2019, 2020, and just sat on the idea of Uber drivers and Uber Eats because nobody was going to take away your business. You guys are literally the original idea when it comes to the smartphone being a taxi for you. Lyft may have came first, but everybody thinks of Uber. We're being honest here. But you guys got greedy. And you guys got nervous because of all the Trump accusations. And you guys got nervous because of the local coverage that it has been getting where there's been creepy Uber drivers, even though taxi drivers are creepy too. So you began to freak out and you go, we need to come up with something and we need to get ahead of the pack. And this isn't you guys trying to have a profound impact. This is you guys freaking out at the fact that you're starting to get negative coverage after having great coverage for the last few years. So you tried something and it just failed. And if I'm the CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, I'd be embarrassed that I'd even let my company be seen where an automated car can't go more than a half a mile. You are the smartphone app that leads the world in being known when it comes to ride shares. Everybody thinks of you. You had everything going for you. This is them freaking out and it has not worked for them. I will tweet out the video where you see the car not drive well for a mile. At Ryan Hoppy Radio. I'm looking at the comments here that we got in real time. I don't know who liked that last rant, but I kept getting heart emojis on the screen. So I guess somebody was really touched by my opinion. My guy, Barris! T. Barris from back in the day when I grew up in the mean blocks of Mount Prospect. He said, what's up, dude? Tell it like it is. I miss you, dude. You got to come on down here to Florida. It's very cool whenever I hear from anybody that I went to high school with and that they're checking out the show, even if it's just this one time or if it's every show. I really do appreciate it because I was a weird, weird guy in high school. Made a lot of odd choices. And I'm weird now, but I was like weird, weird, you know, back in high school. Like, there was a time that I was sick, and I didn't feel well. And I went, and I got like three McDoubles, and I felt really, really sick after getting McDonald's. So I went into the restroom. I had a really bad number two where it was just, it was bad. Like, I felt awful. It smelled awful. And there was this kid named Eric who spread the rumor that I was jacking off in the bathroom. So for four years, even though I never jacked off in the bathroom, everybody referred to me as the weirdo who jacked off in the bathroom. So that's one reason why I never talk about high school. It's throughout four years, I had to deal with everybody going, ha ha, you jacked off in the bathroom, you creep. And then the other weird thing about me in high school, oh man, this is like me going to therapy, is the fact that I was obsessed with this one girl. She was blonde, and she had a very short name. So if people are from Hersey, you know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say who. And I was obsessed with her, even though we never had a conversation. And I had no fighting chance with her because I was 295 pounds with acne, with nothing going for me. But, yeah, I'm going to keep trying, you know, to impress this girl, even though I had nothing going for me. And the last memory, I might start doing this, going down the time machine and going back to 2008 through 2012 when I was in high school. And I know saying that probably makes some people feel old, but here is the last memory I have. And I think Barris, if he's watching, was at this. In 2009, eight years ago, almost a decade ago, I turned 16 years old and all I wanted was to have that moment that's like the movie Superbad, or like the movie American Pie, or Project X, where you have that great party where it's insane. Underage drinking galore, girls everywhere, and it's just going to be the craziest party. I'm going to turn 16. Oh my God. I'm going to get laid finally. Yes. Oh my God. It's going to be great. Even though I live in a small house, somehow inviting 50 drunk teenagers to my house with my family over is going to be a great idea. So I make this Facebook page. It's called Hoppy Bash 2009. And I invite every single cheerleader and every single jock and every single cool kid to my house. And I had my aunt who I hadn't seen in 10 years, had my uncle from Los Angeles, I had my grandpa over, 
I had my two aunts over, I had my three nephews over, and I had my two cousins over, and they're on the deck in my backyard. I lived in like a small ranch house. And the deck is there, connected to the house, obviously, Then you had a decently big backyard. Like, it wasn't huge, but it, t it took a while to mow in the summer. So it was one of those lawns where it wasn't huge, it made you sweaty when you needed to mow the lawn, but it was big enough to have people over. So imagine the deck right next to the house, you have the plants, and then you have 50 drunk teenagers all ignoring you on your birthday. Well, you had a mohawk that was off-center because you let one of the douchebag quarterbacks that didn't like you cut your hair the day before. And nobody pays attention to you on your birthday. Nobody. And I'm not even mad about it. It's not even like I'm having PTSD, but I've never talked about it. So you have every cheerleader over, and this is your big moment to come off cool, you know, in front of your parents to come off cool in front of everybody. This is your big moment to shine and you show how much of a loser you were back there because the party began around 2 p.m. and went until about 5. And at 5.01, Jack L, and if he's watching or if this gets around to Hersey kids, Jack L, from the class of 2012, I'm not mad, I don't care, life's short, this is like eight years ago, I've moved on from it. But there is about 50 kids all eating pizza, all drunk out of their minds. <laughs> And I mean, it's awkward. Nobody's paying attention to me on my birthday. Jack L goes, all right, guys, um, thank you for having us over. It's been quite the party, but um, we're going to go to Dan E's house. And I go, okay, I'm coming. And Dan E, who I'm friends with now, goes, um, that's the thing. You're not invited. And it was that dramatic. And all 50 kids who were drunk in my backyard, the party began at 2 p.m., so it's 5 p.m., just three hours. This is in September, so it's not even dark out yet. Every drunk teenager ditches my house. And if I could say that this is the one time in life that you actually heard crickets in an awkward moment, that was the time in life when you heard crickets in the backyard. As all 50 kids left all the red cups that they were drinking quote-unquote soda out of that we were unaware in the yard, and you just go, wow. The next two years, because I was a sophomore at that point, the next two years of my life, until I graduate, are going to be awful. And I didn't hate high school. It's just the suburb I grew up on, they like, they were just douchebags. You know what I mean? It wasn't even like a bad thing. Like, I'm not mad about it. It's just I was a little awkward, and all I needed was some guidance. All I needed was a big brother. I didn't have a big brother growing up. My dad wasn't very manly. So I just feel like I missed this opportunity where I'm not that awkward. I'm doing well in life. I have a girlfriend. I have my own apartment. I have a dream job. It's not that I have anything wrong with me. I just, I never had a manly role model growing up. I love my dad, rest in peace, but I never had a manly role model. You know, Barris chimed in, T. Barris, who I grew up with. He said, and who is the one person who didn't leave? You didn't, Barris. Good times, man. Talk about eight years ago. Holy shit. Can't believe that was eight years ago that I got ditched. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> in eight years from now, I'm not going to like the fact that I'll be 31 and that eight years prior I was 23. But the fact that 2009 was eight years ago, I think I'm cool with that. That whole memory just brought down PTSD. Like, it's not anywhere comparable to real PTSD that people have to take meds for. But if there was a comparison, that was pretty damn close. Talk about a memory that you'll never, ever forget. Cue the laugh track. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you like black boxes? I love a black box. And I like this song, too, by Black Box. Everybody, which means that happy hour is about to end. But 
That doesn't mean I'm gone forever. You can listen anytime in the world. So maybe this is your first time tuning in to Hoppy Hour. And you're like, where can I listen? How can I listen? All you have to do is get the Hoppy Radio app. So if you have an Android phone and you can get to the Google Play Shop or you have an iPhone, all you have to do is search up Hoppy Radio, H-O-P-P-E Radio. You can listen to me anywhere in the world and you can chat me live. Check out my website, ryanhoppyradio.com, at Ryan Hoppy Radio on uh, Twitter, and ryanhoppyradio.com, and it's Hoppy Radio on Snapchat. And this show has been brought to you by the many sponsors we have on here that have helped make this possible, including Soli's Graphics out of Duluth, Minnesota. Check them out at tinyurl.com slash hoppyhourdecal. It's tinyurl.com slash hoppyhourdecal. For just $2, you can spread the word of Hoppy Hour. Hoppy Hour has also been brought to you by Main Event Boxing. Check them out at 257-528th Avenue North in St. Pete. And call them at 727-564-3948. That's 727-564-3948. Tell them I sent you for a great deal. They are the reason why I won my Celtus punch out. Number three in my fight against Jake Aaron. The following segment is being brought to you by Main Event Boxing as well. I meant to say that. What I meant to say is check out the Tampa Bay Image Factory at tampaimagefactory.com and call them at 813-417-2626. It's 813-417-2626. It's Joe Sale who made those press shots for me last summer. The segment's also been brought to you by Anchorhead Multimedia. Joe Oliger of the 1025 The Bone Promotions team, he's in charge of a lot of the live broadcasts. He's the jack of all trades, he's the jack of all trades in our promotions team. He helped make all of this possible. So look up Anchorhead on Facebook. And Happy Hour, finally, the fifth sponsor has been brought to you by the Cell Solution in South Pasadena. They're at 6800 Gulfport Boulevard South, Suite 107 in South Pasadena. They're right next door to the Walmart Supermart. Tony Spinney and Ryan and Ryan in the tech department, they can fix your phone. They can hook you up with smartphones for the Metro PCS membership. And they can also fix your phone and they have accessories, everything. So call them at 727-331-1934. That's 727-331-1934. All right, I am out of breath. This has been Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, saying peace out.